Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Library of Michigan's webinar series on best story time practices featuring Jennifer Strauss. Hi, Jen. <laughs> um, today we're going to be doing Act It Out and Play, and the links for today's webinar handouts are in the chat box as well as on your screen right now. I'm going to stop sharing it in just a minute, um, as well as a survey uh, at the end of the webinar that we really ask you to take about two minutes to fill out. Uh, it really helps us uh, secure funding in the future for programs like this, thanks to the Institute of Museum and Library Services. So make sure you fill out that survey in a little bit. Um, if you're joining us for the first time, uh, Jennifer and I have been experimenting with these live uh, webinar trainings for you for the past two years now. <laughs> um, so we encourage you to give us feedback through the survey as well um, on how you like this experience. There are a lot of libraries um, that have staff come and go. So these webinars are also available on our webinars um, archive page uh, on the Library of Michigan's website. So I'll be sure to share that link as well. And you can contact me directly um, at my emails on your screen right now. Uh, Lancaster C5 at Michigan.gov or um, if you have any questions for Jennifer um, or like some additional information on what she does today her email is also there on your screen at Jennifer with one N at storybetold.com so without further ado and Completing no technical difficulties. We've had some smooth sailing the last couple <laughs> of rounds, um, but we do have a little bit of uh, mic delay sometimes, so you might hear us talk over each other. We'll try not to do that, um, but we do have a little mic delay you might notice uh, upon occasion. So without further ado, I will now hand this over to Jen. All right, welcome everyone to this webinar. It's um, the last in a series of four of the best story time practices that Kathy and I have put out um, this year, 2018-19. And last winter, there were three that we um, also did. So if you go to the archive and you um, want more information or you want more ideas like the ones you're going to see today, please go back to those webinars. There's so much more information in there. And a lot of it will overlap some of the concepts we're going to talk about today with play. So um, I'm going to be covering ideas that I haven't done in any of the other webinars, but there's a lot of more play ideas in those. So I hope you'll go back to the archive and view some of those that we've already worked hard. We did have technical di difficulties in the first two, but there's still really good information in there that I think you can reap and use um, in your story times. So welcome everyone. Really glad to be here. I'm a little sad, Kathy, that this is our last webinar. Um, I've had a great time um, planning them and getting them organized for you. So I hope you enjoy this one. Um, as a storyteller and somebody who's been doing story times myself for 20 27 years and um, specifically working with young children more specifically in the last two years than I ever have most everything that I do in my um, programs and performances involves participation in play and so we're going to specifically look at those things and ideas that you can use to really get um, students uh, and patrons and young patrons involved in play so if you have your handouts, I'm just going to talk a little bit about theory and research for a few minutes before we get started, because since the late 1900s, so late 19, I'm sorry, not 1900s, the late 1990s, forgive me, um, until now, there's been an incredible amount of research. And I think it's kind of funny that we have to do all this research now to realize that children benefit from play, right? Um, they do it naturally. But what we're finding out in the research is that play is an incredibly important aspect of developing language and literacy skills from zero to five. And so um, I want you to, oh, there's no sound. Someone has no sound, Kath, on theirs. Um, we have sound, so just keep going, oh, Jen. I'll work okay, on I'll it. I'll keep going, okay, thank yep. you. So anyway, all this research is indicating what we've already known, except the research is really paying attention to brain development in zero to fivers and how play has um, contributed to that development. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the first um, pages of your handout and talk a little bit about just eight aspects of play that contribute to language and literacy development. 
So the first thing is that it stimulates a child's curiosity and imagination. That prefrontal cortex, part of their brain, lights up in play so that they can imagine. And so that's first one. The second, um, when we allow children to play, structured and non-structured play, it expands their cognitive thinking skills. Through play, children learn um, how to communicate with each other. They learn how to problem solve together, compromise. And those are all higher order cognitive skills. Um, by acting out in play, children practice roles and learn how to make sense of their world. So in role play, in play, they can get a feel for what it's like to be a mommy or a daddy or a grocery store person, right? So they can use that play in order to do that. Um, the next one is during play, children practice their fine and gross motor skills using props and puppets and costumes. They are using fine and gross motor skills. And when we engage them in those skills, we're getting them ready to hold utensils in their hands to be able to write and draw later on. So those are all really, really important for reading and writing readiness. Um, play promotes language development, it builds their vocabulary, it helps them with comprehension skills, and it helps children use language in a particular context. Last one, play helps children develop narrative, my favorite, storytelling skills. So they start to understand what sequencing is when they play in story. And they start to understand and get a real feeling for the beginning, the middle, and the end of a story and how to build those details as they play. So um, we're going to be um, covering quite a few different stories today. I'm gonna to show you how you can use them to help your um, patrons play. So how do we do it? There's several ways that we can allow our kids to play. And one of the ways is just to set up an area in your library, in the youth section of your library, and maybe some of you already have this, where you have costumes and you have puppets and you have objects, maybe common objects that they're used to seeing every day, like food or, or different things in that area. And you can just allow them when they come in to use those costumes and props and puppets to come up with their own play. So there's a lot of value in just letting um, little ones play on their own and imagine and create on their own. The second thing that we can do to promote play is that we can actually give them a little bit of structure. So it could be in a story time or just interacting with students who come into your library. You might give them a framework as you introduce them to those props and puppets and costumes in your library. You might say to them, let's play grocery store today or let's play school, or let's play family, or let's play hospital. And you can come up with a number of those and then show them the objects and see what they come up with. One of the really powerful things is for children to use objects that are familiar in brand new ways, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. The other thing that you can do in story time as youth librarians is introduce them to a story. Read that story to them in that story time and talk about it and discuss that story and then put that book down and let the little ones in front of you act that story out. And so today I'm going to show you several ideas from really wonderful repetitive stories, traditional stories that you can have um, play be an interactive part of it. And it doesn't matter how many people are in the audience for all of these stories in order to play. In your handouts on the second page, I've given you a list of all the stories I'm going to introduce today and the authors. Probably all of them will be familiar to you. And then I want to um, point out that there are two um, links at the bottom of the second page of your handouts that I think are going to be really helpful to you after this webinar. The first one I found um, is called 10 Books that promote dramatic play by a woman named Meredith who has a site called Homegrown Friends. And if you get, click on that site, you're gonna get her resource and it's incredible for little ones, so check that out. And then the second site or, or link that I want to um, point out on the handout will take you to a site that has all the current research about play and how important it is to language and literacy development. So on the second page of your handout, you'll see those two links on the bottom of the second page. And I hope you'll use those resources after this webinar to help you keep doing what we're gonna learn how to do today. All right, so I always like to start with a welcome song. If any of you have been a part of any of my um, webinars, 
um, either last year or this year. You know that we've talked about um, structuring the webinar so that there's a format, a welcome song that you always do, or a theme-based welcome song, and then closing your story time with another song that maybe closes it out every week when you're together, or has some connection to the theme that you're using in that story time. So I also want to tell you that play is just one of the five practices that have been defined by every child ready to read that we should have in our webinars. And I've talked about these in just about every webinar that I've put out. But in your handouts, you also have all five of the five practices described and defined, and also a chart for all five of those practices, which helps you understand why it's important to incorporate those five practices in your story time. And they are talking, singing, reading, writing, and finally play. And so today we're focusing, zooming in on that one of the five practices called play. And we know it's just as important as all the other five when we're creating our story time. So you ready for a song? I picked this song for this webinar because in it we can role play many different characters. But it's a call and response song that you've probably heard before. But we change the characters in every um, verse so that your audience and you can sing this song together. But they're also practicing different roles in different ways. So I'm going to stand up. It's called A Boom Chicka Boom. And you have the words outlined now. So you don't have to have them in front of you in order to do it. But if I'm all by myself, you can do that, all right? I'll be, so I can't I'll be goofy you, with you. So I'm going to be doing Okay, you're going to sure. do the response part, Kat? Uh, all right, so let me stand up and get going if on If people this can one, stand right? hearing me sing. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So for the first and the last verse, the motion is lap, clap. So let's practice that a little bit. Lap, clap, lap, clap. That's about the rhythm that we're going to go. Are we on a delay, Kat? Maybe. <laughs> it's okay if you don't join me. It might be a little distracting. Okay. <laughs> so I'll just do the call and response, all right? So it goes like this. I said a boom, chicka boom. I, I said a boom, chicka boom. I said a boom, chicka boom. I said a boom, chicka boom. I said a boom, chicka rocka, chicka rocka, chicka boom. I said a boom, chicka rocka, chicka rocka, chicka boom. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. One more time. One more time. Motorcycle style. Motorcycle style. Get your motorcycle up. I said varoom, chick varoom. I, I said varoom, chick a room. I said varoom, chick varoom. I said varoom, chick a room. I said varoom, chick a rocker, chick a rocker, chick varoom. I said varoom, chick a rocker, chick a rocker, chick a room. Hang ten. Hang ten. Stay cool. Stay cool. One more time. One more time. Cowboy style. Cowboy style. <laughs> I said Yahoo, chickaboo. I, I said Yahoo, chickaboo. I said lasso, chickaboo. I said lasso, chickaboo. I said lasso, chickaropa, chickaropa, chickaboo. I said lasso, ropa, chickaropa, chickaropa. Funny. Yeehaw! Yeehaw! Yahoo! Yahoo! One more time. One more time. Rocker dude style. Oh, rocker dude style. I said, hey, dude, chickaboo. Hey, dude, chickaboo. I said, hey, dude, chickaboo. Hey, dude, chickaboo. I said, hey, dude, chicka rocker, chicka rocker, chicka I said, hey, dude, chicka rocker, chicka rocker, chicka Catch you later. Catch you later. You stay cool. You stay cool. One more time. One more time. Underwater style. Underwater style. So this is finger on your lip, right? And the kids just crack up with this one. I really hope everybody's doing this with us. 
I said a boom, chick a boom. I said a boom, chick a boom. I said a boom, chick a boom. I said a boom, chick a rocker, chick a rocker, chick a boom. I said a boom, chick a rocker, chick a rocker, chick a boom. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. No more times. No more times. So those are just a few, right? So what's really great about this pattern and this song is one, it's call and response. And two, you can have the kids come up with the next style. You can call them up and have them lead the next style if they're courageous enough. And it's pretty endless all the ways that you can do it. You can do it in quiet, right? You can do it really loud. You could do it in baby voice. So they could come up with any or all of the next verses that you add on and let everybody participate and let them play with different roles in this song. So it's beautiful and it's perfect for what we, what we want to be doing with those kids. So the second thing I want to show you is a warm-up activity that helps them um, play with roles, play with voice, and play with using an object in a whole new way, an object that maybe they don't look at and think of something, but then turn it into something that they are familiar with. So what I did, you guys, is I printed out from my book the whole chapter, and this is in your handouts, and it's called The Story Stick. So I copied the whole chapter, but I want you to know that if you like this idea, there are many more of them on my website. The book is called Telling Stories, the Cygnus Storytelling Handbook. And there's a ton of ideas for using story with families and children to get them participating and involved in storytelling, story reading, and story writing. So you can get that on my website if you want the whole book. All right? So story sticks. Let me show you how I make these with, um, with my kids. I go to the hardware store. And I buy a pack of what's called door shims. So when something's lopsided in your house or a door isn't quite even and you put installing a new door, you put a shim under something so that it evens it up. They are 24 in a pack and cost about $3. So they're great. The other thing I love about using these to create story sticks is that there's a flat surface of wood here and here. It's easy to put tape stickers or sharpie markers or paint or finger paint or whatever to decorate them and the kids love decorate them really easy craft project to help them find their voice and know that they can be storytellers so shims this is what some of them end up looking like and the point of the story stick is a, a few one it gives them permission to focus on a stick and not feel embarrassed as we do activities with it the second thing that it does is that whoever holds the stick is the speaker and it gives them the opportunity to speak and whoever is in that group that is not holding the stick are the listeners so it's a really wonderful way to help them understand what speaking is like and then listening to others really wonderful so I'm going to give you just a few examples today but you have the whole chapter in your handouts and you can read through and see what other ones you think you might want to try with your students I say students because of my teaching background with your patrons all right and with your kids and story time so the first one that I do and they giggle and carry on with this and they love it so much that they're going to want to do it again it's just the simplest of the activities and it's called this is a stick so we're all sitting in a great big circle so everybody can see each other and i usually start this by handing the stick to the person next to me and i say this is a stick you instruct them to say back to you a what and you say a stick and they say oh a stick and they take it from you now this goes around the circle that same way but they get really silly and they start acting in different roles and they start acting in different voices so you'll see it in the handout but again it's this this is a stick if you were my next person you'd say a what and i'd say a stick and you'd say oh a stick 
and you would take it and then pass it to the next person in the same exact way. This is a stick. A what? A stick. Oh, a stick. Now, as it goes around the circle, you're going to hear the giggles emerge and you're going to see the personalities emerge. So the second time around, I tell them they have to do it in a different style, a different emotion. So I might go like this. <gasps> this is a stick. And whoever I'm handing it to has to copy the same emotion that I'm using or copy my voice. So they'd say, <gasps> a what? And I'd say, it's a stick. And they'd say, oh, a stick. The next person might change that emotion by going like this. This is a stick. And whoever they were handing it to would have to copy what they were doing. Oh, what? A stick. Oh, a stick. Right? And then the next one might be, this is a stick. A what? It's a stick. Oh. A stick and I guarantee that as you go around that circle they're gonna get sillier and sillier with this so try that one out the other one that I love to do especially with the younger kids as I say this is an ordinary stick but I want you to use it and show us something that you do every single day right so they're gonna look at that stick an object and turn it into an object that they use for a different purpose this is really great cognitive skills for them so some of them might go like this right I've seen that I've seen this I've seen them use it as a cell phone of course right I've seen them use it as a microphone karaoke or singing into a microphone stirring something that they might be making painting or writing or drawing so you let it go around and you you let them turn something that's just a plain object into something that they use every day and that pantomime is going to help them when they get different props in their hands or costumes or puppets to know how to use that object in a whole new way when they're in the middle of play in a story okay so I hope you'll use the this is a stick activities um, with your patrons as a warm-up or as an activity or whatever it is that you want to use it for it's really fun and then maybe you can have those blank shims around and some tape and stickers and pipe cleaners and whatever stickers the foamy stickers work really great the stuff that's non messy is really great right so they can decorate those and go home with their own voice their own story stick so I hope you'll use that alrighty so let's get busy um, on introducing some of the stories that I've brought for you that are all about play today um, I have six on my list. I hope we can get to those. I'm going to check and see how we're doing. We're doing great. Okay. So the very first story that I want to share with you, and I'm going to share it with you in two different ways. I call it the small version, and then the large acted out version is the hungry caterpillar. So let me grab my cups. So the small version of the hungry caterpillar that is a play story. Um, I pack it all up in a bag like this, and you know the Hungry Caterpillar comes in all different sizes, but this is the pocket size version of that story. So if you're doing play with a Hungry Caterpillar in story time, I would definitely read that book first like you would any book in story time, right? Talk about it and carry on about it and point things out and ask those good questions and get those responses from your listeners. And then we're going to put the book away and play. Now I have to tell you, I know very well that the caterpillar and the ugly ca caterpillar eats through all those wonderful fruits and vegetables, but also eats through a bunch of things that aren't very good for you. So when I made the props for the play part of this story, I only stopped at the really good yummy fruits and vegetables and I didn't make props for the other stuff, but you certainly can, right? It depends on how much energy you want to put into this and also how many kids are going to be in your audience. How many do you want to involve in that? You might need a few more of the other food items, right? So read the book. But the reason I wanted to show you this bag is that I put all the props from that play session and story time into this bag, right? And have it available for kids to take home. If they want to play at home, they can check it out and then bring it back and have it available for other families who want to take it home. And you'll promote that concept of play at home. If you have story bags with the book in the pocket and all the props that they need to play with inside that bag. So I love this idea. So let me show you the small version and then I'll show you the large version which gets those kids actually up in a bigger way and playing. 
Um, all the props that I made in this story I found on Etsy. You know how wonderful that is. Or you go to Pinterest. There's always somebody out there who's already created this stuff. So I hope you'll go there to look. The Hungry Caterpillar is a sock puppet, right? And I made him to look almost just like the one that's in Eric Carle's book. So that familiarity decorated with a few other sparkly things, but the Hungry Caterpillar. When I do this in story time in the small version, I'm the Hungry Caterpillar. But I hand out all the things that the Hungry Caterpillar chomps on to all the members of the audience, all right? So with the kids that are willing, there's some kids you know that there's some that are really shy and they're not gonna wanna do it. So you're looking for those kids who really feel confident that they wanna do it. And one of them will hold the one apple that the Caterpillar chomps through. And if you have a lot in the audience, you can split all of these up and get more students, more children involved, right? Two pairs. If it's a small audience, you can keep those pairs together. Three plums, it's a great counting story as well to reinforce the counting, right? So the three plums. There's four strawberries. Again, you can hand one out to each child or the whole clump. I did this a couple weeks ago and I only had six kids in my audience. And so I gave them all the fruit of the same kind and they were that fruit carrier. And then five oranges, right? So I start by telling the story with a leaf that has the egg for the caterpillar on it. And if you know the story, you'll know that it starts by saying, one night in the moonlight, a little egg sat on a leaf. And it sat on that leaf for one week and for two weeks and for three weeks. And after it had been warmed by the sun and the, the rays of the sun, and after rain had come down on it, one day out from that little egg, there came, right, a caterpillar. And when he came out, he realized that he was really hungry. And the caterpillar said, I'm really hungry. And he went out looking for things to eat. Well, the first thing that he saw out there was a juicy red, really describe it, right? Juicy red apple hanging on a tree. Now, one of the kids is going to be holding that apple. So the caterpillar is going to come over and they are going to put that piece of fruit over the caterpillar's head. And I'm going to do this. Yum, 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 munch, 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 chomp, chomp, chomp. And I might even tweak them in the tummy if they feel brave and I feel like that's okay, right? They giggle, right? If the caterpillar kind of bumps up against their tummy, they giggle at that. So I'm going to go to every kid in that same pattern. So he went to sleep that night and felt great, but he woke up the next morning and he said, and now they're going to join you, I'm really hungry. And he went out and found those two pairs. Now it might be two different students, right? Two, two different kids or pairs in one child's hand. And he's going to go up and yum, 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 chomp through those. Now I'm going to speed up ahead and tell you that they're going to do that with every single one. So he goes to bed at night feeling much better, wakes up the morning and says, I'm really hungry, and chomps through the, pe the pears, the plums, the strawberries. Again, this can be one child at a time or in groups, right? Until he's chomped through all of that luscious, yummy, healthy fruit. The last thing that he's going to do then is go to sleep. And that caterpillar, and watch, take that puppet off, fold up all the fruit. That caterpillar, wove a house around himself after he was good and full and he wove that house around himself and he stayed inside of that cocoon for one week and for two weeks and for three weeks and after three weeks of staying in that cocoon what emerged from that wonderful cocoon, and this is down in the bottom of the cocoon, right, and it's a finger puppet that is a butterfly, what emerged, of course, is a beautiful butterfly, all right? So in this version, you're handing the pieces out, they are involved in the play, but it's a little more controlled by you. So you gotta kinda judge your group, but you can go from this one to the bigger play one that I'm gonna show you right now, or you can do this one week and get them used to playing on a smaller scale, and then the next week you can tell them we're gonna act out the Hungry Caterpillar in a bigger style, all right? So the, um, the cocoon is just um, fleece, that I cut and sewed in the shape of a, a cocoon. Um, I found the butterfly um, at the dollar store on a pair of uh, a headband. And then um, I put uh, a place for me to put my finger in to make it a puppet, okay? You can also get puppets that are butterflies.
here. Any questions on that one before I move on to the bigger version of this one? Any questions? Okay, everybody doing all right? So really, really wonderful, really wonderful play for small groups or kids that are a little bit, you know how they're really shy when they're a lot younger? Four and five-year-olds tend to watch you more than participate because they're really watching their worlds and they're a little um, hesitant, but this will help them get used to it. So let's go to the bigger version. So in the bigger version... I went to the dollar store and bought a pair of butterfly wings. So when that butterfly comes out of the cocoon, they're going to wear those wings. And you guys, it has them. It just slips over their arms, like one arm and the other, so they can wear them on their back, right, like this. And for the person who um, plays the butterfly, I also made a headband with butterfly wings on it. They love this stuff. So that's the butterfly. But she's got to hide away until the – caterpillar goes into the cocoon and she stands or he stands behind the cocoon and then she comes fluttering out at that point when the butterfly comes out of the cocoon. Um, when I pick the person to be the caterpillar, I give them a pair of caterpillar antennae like this, right? So one of them's going to be a caterpillar, one of them's going to be the butterfly. And again, I have all the fruit, but this time much larger version, right? Much bigger fruit, so that they can actually put it over the head of the person who's the caterpillar, right? So I start the story the same way, but you get everybody in their role. So who wants to be the apple? Who wants to be the pears? Who wants to be the plums? Who wants to be the strawberries and the oranges? So you can give one to each student or each participant. Or again, if you have a small crowd, they can be the pairs and put both of them over the caterpillar's head. But this enlists a little bit more play because you have to have a pretty bold caterpillar, right? And I start the story the same way. I say, there was a leaf, and on that leaf there was an egg, and there it was in the moonlight, and it sat for one week, and two weeks, and three weeks, the sun shone down on it, the rain dripped down on it, until one day emerging was the caterpillar. So one of your patrons is going to be the caterpillar, and you tell them, how are you feeling? Really hungry. And so they have to practice their lines, oh, I'm really hungry, or they might say, oh, I'm starving, or whatever way they interpret that play, you let them do that. It's going to be their play now, and it's going to probably veer away from what Eric Carle had in mind, and you know what? That's awesome, all right? So the caterpillar goes from person to person, and you're still narrating. So the caterpillar went out on the first day and said, I'm really hungry, and looked out and saw a juicy red apple hanging from a tree. So the caterpillar goes over to the, whoever's holding the apple, and they get to put that fruit right over the caterpillar's head. Okay, so you do that with all the fruit. And again, if you want to add all that junk food, you go for it. I just didn't want to give that message. But if you have a really big story time and you want everybody to play, you might want to have one of these for everybody in the audience, right? So then by the time they get done, they have all this, all this fruit, right? All this fruit over their head. The whole pile is over their head. And then finally, that caterpillar... I have one more prop, and this gives one more kid a chance to participate. Chewed through one more green leaf, and he felt full, and so he decided to go to sleep. Now, the cocoon on this one is a much bigger piece of fleece, right? I made a big tube so that the bottom is, um, the bottom is out of it, so they can just step into this without getting caught up in it, and they pull it up. Now, some kids are not going to want it to be over their head, right? So be really careful about what you do with this. You could just pull it up here and let their cute little head stick out of it. Some kids want to go way down in it and be in that cocoon, so you can do that. And he sat in that cocoon for one week and two weeks and three weeks until out emerged, and you take this off, right? And you get that kid to move aside, and then the butterfly who's hiding behind that cocoon comes out and flutters around your library. And they are the one that's wearing the butterfly headband and the butterfly wings, but they have to hide until that caterpillar is in the cocoon. And then they come up and hide behind the cocoon, and when he emerges or she emerges, she emerges as a butterfly. All right, so that's the bigger version. And I've had some pretty wild things go on with that story. But you want to not control, all, you want to control behaviors, of course. But you don't want to control their creativity and their imagination as they take that story to a new level. All right, so that's the hungry caterpillar in the small and large version of that story. Are there any questions? Any questions out there? 
Can you see yourself doing this? Say yes or no in that chat box. Can you see yourself trying this? The props were really easy to make. I mean, not hard at all. It's all felt and glue, right? Oh, good. Okay. I hope you will try this because it's just a really wonderful way to build their language skills. I mean, you just can't give them a better chance after reading a book to them to let them act it out and let them become involved in that story. You know? And I, also, I thought of an adaptation um, if kids are shy and not wanting to wear... The costume is maybe having props on sticks right images okay. like blown up fruit from the yep sure, on, put it on sticks, sticks. Sure, yep. and then they could collect those sticks whatever way you want to adapt this is up to you you know this is the way i do it but i always hope when i do these webinars that you're going to see something that i'm presenting and you're going to get a whole nother idea for how you're going to do it in fact i've heard from webinar participants who send me pictures of the props they've made after watching me do some of this and it's beautiful to watch the adaptations of what every librarian does with this stuff so do what you want with it all right. So the second story that um, we're going to move on to is called The Enormous Turnip. I don't have the book here to hold up. It's a very, very old Russian folktale. There are many, many versions of this story. There's the enormous turnip. There's the giant turnip. There's the um, enormous radish. They've gone on to other vegetables, right? There's the giant pumpkin. So it has been adapted in many different ways. So you can do this seasonally if you want, or you can do all of them and show the different versions. But I love this story because you can add as many participants to this story as you want by just adding characters on or as few as you have in your audience at that time and it's a wonderful role play so if you know the enormous turnip you know that it's a, a grandpa who goes out one day to plant a turnip and he and he puts that turnip in the ground and grandma waters it and they talk to the seed and water it and so finally that turnip emerges and it grows and it grows until it's finally the most enormous turnip they have ever grown well grandpa decides one day that it's big enough and he's going to go try and pull it out of the ground and i've added a song to this and it goes like this and he pulled and he pulled and he pulled and he pulled but he could not get that turnip out so he tries. He can't do it. He goes and gets grandma. They hang on to each other. And I'll describe this in a little bit more detail when I hold up the props. She holds on to grandpa. With the kids, I just have them hold on to hands or wrists, right? And then we have to talk about not really pulling, that we are pretending to pull and show them what it looks like to just pretend to pull because you know how that could go. Right? So grandma joins on and they pulled and they pulled and they pulled and they pulled, but they could not get the turnip out. Now you can add as many characters as you want from here. So I always add the granddaughter who's staying there, um, the grandson who's a teenager and we have to wake him up to get him to come help. Then the younger brother, he's staying with grandma and grandpa. They can't get the turnip out. So the younger brother is brilliant. He goes in the barn and gets the horse. Then they go get the cow and the pig, right? So as many animals as you want to add to this, they go get the dog and the cat. They're all pull and they pull and they pull and they pull. Could not get the turnip out until the end of the story. A little mouse comes along, joins the end of the line. Small is mighty. And they pull and they pull and they pull and they pull. And the turnip comes out. So at that point, you have the kid who's playing the turnip just stand up from the chair that he's sitting in. And the end of the story, they take that turnip home, they make soup out of it, and everybody gets a big bowl of turnip soup, and it just shows to Goya what you can do when you work together. So it's a really lovely story about working together. So let me show you the props that I use, and they're not elaborate, they don't have to be, but those kids are gonna take those roles and you're not gonna tell them all the lines to say, they're gonna do it in whatever way they act out and play with that story. So. Let me show you the props I use. So for grandpa, he has a big old farmer's hat. That's all grandpa has is a big old farmer's hat. Grandma has a sun hat as well, but I always put an apron on grandma. So grandma wears a sun hat for working in the garden and the apron. The daughter who's staying with them, because this is a Russian folktale, I do a little babushka action, right? So we tie a babushka on here got to wash them between times right we don't want lice so babushka for the daughter that's all um for the for the teenager who they have to wake up i gave them a really cool fedora and a pair of sunglasses they love this one right 
and they have to wake them up. You have to say, wake up, grandma and grandpa need help. And the whole audience says, wake up. And that teenager is sitting over there pretending to be sleeping. We wake him up before he comes out to join the line and to help. So that's him. For the younger brother, I got to get rid of this now because our beach bums are no longer in Traverse City, but he has a baseball cap on. And then the animals, oh, I didn't show you the turnips. So here's what I did. I went to um, Joanne Fabrics. They had visors in many different colors. You might have seen them, they're a dollar, right? And I decorated just the visor for each of the other parts, the animals and the turnip. So one kid is gonna be the turnip and sitting in that chair after grandpa plants them in the ground, right? And so that's the turnip. This is all made out of foamy and a glue gun. They go get a horse. I took a gray baseball cap and put horsey ears on it with felt, okay? And then all the others, except for the mouse, are made out of those, um, well, not all of them, sorry. So the cow at Michael's, they have, um, they have felt that looks just like cow, right? So I gave that one cow ears, and that's just a visor. And I use these for many different play stories, and I'll show you as we move along. Um, the pig, pink visor, pink ears. The dog, I, um, I took a headband and put ears on it, right? So that's the dog. The cat is another white visor with kitty cat ears. And finally, the mouse for me, and you can make this any way you want, but I had a stocking cap that I put the mousey ears on and put that on the kit. Again, washing these in between, um, sanitizing these between every time you use them, all right? So those are the props that I use for this story. And I really just narrate in a very simple way. Like one day, Grandpa went out and decided to plant a turnip. They go out, the person who's playing Grandpa, and he dug a hole in the garden. They'll dig, right? He put the seed in. He's going to take that kid who is the, the turnip and put him down on the chair, and he covered him up with dirt, and he watered it, and then Grandpa said, grow big and strong, grow big and sweet. Grandma comes out and waters it. Um, you'll see in the story, and you can follow any of those versions uh, of the enormous turnip that you want. And um, they watch, and they water, and they speak to the turnip until it grows really big. And when Grandpa finally thinks that it's big enough to go out of the ground, he goes out and tries to pull it, right? Pulls and he pulls, and he can't get the turnip out. All of those other characters get added onto the line. And again, here's Grandpa holding on to the arm of the kid who's the turnip, and everybody else is just holding on to arms. So you don't want to get into that pushy-pulley, hurt each other. And we have to be careful about how we have them touch each other. So it sort of looks like this. And they pulled, and they pulled, and they pulled, and they pulled, but they could not get the turnip out. So all of them get on to the end. You got to make sure you have the mouse. And when the mouse comes on, of course, the strongest and the mightiest gets the job done with everybody else. So that's how I do the big play. And again, you just narrate and you see what comes out of them in terms of being a horse. They can make the sounds of the animals. Um, you can guide that a little bit, but I would really let them use their own creativity and imagination to put themselves into that story. It's a really fun one, no matter what version you do. And it's a really easy one to set the props up for. So are there any questions on that one? I'm not going to get to all my stories today, so I'm going to pick and choose here. Um, we'll, we'll do the, the next one, and then I'm going to show you some other ways to get kids playing together. Um, for the other three, you can check those books out. Um, there's lots of different ways to, to do them, and they are all repetitive. And I'll talk about those a little bit, but I'm not going to have time to present all six of them to you today. So let me do the, one of my absolute favorites. And oh, I've had so much fun with this one this year. Maybe you've seen it before. It's called Something from Nothing. Okay, I just got a question. How old are the kids in your story hours? Anywhere from toddlers, and I do this in a whole more, like, more directed way, anywhere from toddlers <laughs> all the way up to, to elementary school age kids who love to do this. I've gotten um, middle school kids to do the giant turnip, and it's hysterical. But usually the kids that are in front of me for those story time ages can be anywhere from toddler to preschoolers and even a little older than that. So if you have first graders, second graders, and by chance in that story time, like homeschoolers, then they love participating in this as well. You know as well as I do that you alter how you do your story time depending on the age of the, of the kids that are in front of you. So you may be directing more of this and they may only have the courage to put the hat on and, and get up there and hold on to each other's hands and you sing the song and the audience sings the song. They may not be providing all that many lines 
um, when they're that young. You know what I mean? So you alter it according to the age of the audience or your story time audience. All right. So let me show you this one. It's called Something from Nothing, and you may have seen this before. I absolutely love this story. So again, you would read it in your story time. You would talk about it. You would look at all the pictures and talk about the roles and all of that, and then you would put that book down after reading it and say, we're going to act this out. So in this story, there's a grandpa who happens to be a tailor, and when his little grandson is born, well, he makes a beautiful coat for him. But the boy wears that coat so much that he wears it out and he takes it back to grandpa, who's a tailor, and says, can you make something else out of this? And grandpa says, yes. And the repeating line in this story is this. He turned it around, he turned it around, and he turned it around. And let me grab props for this one. Hang on. All right. So the repeating line in this story is that every time he takes this object back to grandpa and asks him to turn it into something else, he turned it around and turned it around and turned it around. I have scissors, but the audience is going to do this. He took his scissors and went snip, snip, snip. He took his needle and thread and went up and down, up and down, up and down. And the audience, they're doing it with you like this. Really great directional stuff. And he turned it into, and so the next thing is a vest. And then that little boy wears that vest so much, he wears it out and takes it back to grandpa, who turns it into many things. I'll show you that in just a minute. There are many ways you can do this. Um, and with a group of students just a, a, a little while ago, I did it where it was the parent handing it on to the child the parent handing it on to the child. So it was a different child that was getting that item. But they every time they went back to the tailor and he took that object and turned it around and turned it around and turned it around, took his scissors and went snip, snip, snip. Took that needle and thread and went up and down, up and down, up and down and turned it into something else. So let me show you how I set this up. Um, I happen to have a lot of red clothing because I love the color red. So I gathered all this stuff up from my home. And you know how you go to Goodwill or you go to um, some secondhand store and look for your props and costumes. So the first thing that I gathered is the baby blanket that grandpa gives to that baby when he's born. So baby's born. And grandpa takes this beautiful red blanket and wraps that baby up and sings to him and talks to him. And he loves that blanket so much that he uses it when he's a baby, but even drags it around when he's a toddler and chews on the end until finally the blanket is worn out. So it can be that they take that blanket back to the tailor, you know, and then that whatever's made out of that is given to the next kid in line. I usually line up a whole bunch of chairs up in front and see who wants to be a part of this, right? Who wants to play? So you take the blanket to the tailor who turns it around and turns it around and turns it around. Take those scissors and go snip, 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 thread up and down, up and down, right? Every time. And turns that blanket into a jacket. So that next kid puts on that red jacket, right? And that's the next prop. And he wears it so much. He wears it to school and he wears it on the playground and he doesn't wear any other jacket until finally he wears that jacket out. And so the same routine over and over again. And you know how lovely that repetition is for those little ones, right? Takes it to the tailor and goes through that whole series of repetition and the whole audience is doing that with you. And he turns it into something else. So he turns the head jacket now into a vest. So the next kid wears that vest. And he wears that vest for years and years. And he wears it to fancy occasions. And he wears it to not so fancy occasions. And he loves it so much that he wears it out back to the tailor. Turns it around, turns it around, snip, 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 up and down, up and down. Who turns that vest into a hat. So the hat then gets brought back to the tailor after it wears out, gives it to grandpa, who turns it into a handkerchief, right? And he wears it when he's running, and he wears it in his pocket, and he wears it when he's sick to blow his nose, and finally wears that handkerchief up, takes it back to grandpa, and all that grandpa can make out of it, where do you go with it? Okay. All that grandpa can now make out of it is a button. So the young man wears that button, 
and he wears it and he wears it until one day he looks down and realizes that the button is gone. He's lost the button and he goes back to grandpa and says, I have nothing left of my baby blanket. You know, and grandpa looks up and says, oh, you're so wrong. You do have something left. You have the story to tell about the blanket that I turned into a coat, to a vest, to a hat, to a handkerchief, and into a button. So it's a beautiful circle story. Everybody gets to play, and you can control that play as much or as little as you want in terms of what you will let them do with that story. So any questions on that one? Have you guys used this story before? And I think I saw that there was another version that was mentioned in the chat box as well. Yeah, Beautiful. the Joseph had a little overcoat is a right. similar tale. Right. I love this story because I had a grandpa like that. I came from a Russian background, and this really reminds me of my grandpa. So I gravitated to that story. That, and you can add on or take away parts, right? These are the wonderful stories. You don't know how many students, kids are going to be in your story time. And so you can have a lot of props or just a few props, and you can still play with all of these stories. So the other ones I want you to check out that I didn't have time to show you all the props for today. And Kathy, we're going to have to do another webinar, right? You um, can, um, <laughs> we, um, I think you have you have time. You have about five more minutes before. Yeah, I'm going to mention these um, okay. because I want you to know that these are other stories that lend themselves the same way as the ones that I've given you examples of today for props. In fact, I use a lot of those animal hats over and over again in these. So the one is called The Squeaky Door by Margaret Reed McDonald. Little girl sleeps over grandma's house and she goes to bed. And there's, again, repetition, same lines over and over again. Are you going to be scared? No, grandma. But then grandma closes the door and it's squeaky. Eep, boom. Grandma, 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 come back. She comes in and says, are you scared? Yeah. Do you want me to put the cat in bed with you? Grandma gets the cat. She kisses the girl. She kisses the cat. She closes the door again. So you can see how this repetition and all the same hats for the animals, right? She puts the kitty in bed with her. She puts the doggy in bed with her. She goes out in the barn and she puts the pig, the cow, and the horse until finally, <laughs> finally she comes in and says, what are we going to do? You're still scared. And the little girl says in some versions, can I sleep with you? And she goes and sleeps with grandma, but she has to bring her kitty with her. And the next day grandpa goes out and he oils the door so it doesn't squeak anymore. Right? So all the same animals can be brought into bed and I line up chairs and get big blankets and let them all pretend that they're getting in bed with the little girl whose name is Sally. And what's fun about it is that grandma, whoever plays grandma, and we do it this way, like this, right? Kisses the kitty, meow. Kisses the puppy, woof woof. And they're making the sounds of the animals. Kisses the pig, ooh, oink oink. Kisses the cow, moo. Kisses the horse, me or as many animals as you want to put in there right so they get to do their sound effects over and over again they feel a part of it but it's not hard for them to participate and you can be grandma right so if you want to you could be the grandma but you can also make a really courageous kid the grandma who's going to be able to handle that role okay so that's an amazing story to do and i do it in a little version on my lap on a pillow you know with a little doll and and that and I have it all here, I'm like, ah. But I do it a little version, like I did with the caterpillar, and then big version to play with. And the little version has stuffed animals that I'm putting in the bed with a little doll who is Sally. And I do the whole story with them, but they help me with the lines and the sounds of the animals. And the kiss Sally tonight, kiss the kitty goodnight. And they're all on my lap on a big pillow that looks like a bed, all right? So you can do the squeaky door in small version and large version as well. All right. So Mortimer, you guys probably all know the story about Mortimer. Or if you don't, you should, because Robert Munch is one of my favorites because he was a storyteller first and an author second, right? So he really knows how to tell a good story. This is a great acted out one. So little Mortimer doesn't want to go to sleep at night and everybody is coming up to tell him to go to sleep. And there's a song in it that everybody sings. And so that song is repetitive. It goes clangity, clang, clang, bangity, bang, bang. I'm going to sing my song all night. So the whole audience participates, whether they're coming up to play or not. So there's parts in this story for little Mortimer. You make a little bed, right? And again, in a chair with a blanket. And he doesn't want to go to sleep. Mom comes up first. You already saw my mom props, right? Little apron. Mortimer, be quiet. Dad comes up. And I think I have a tie for Dad. We put a tie on for Dad. He comes up. Mortimer, be quiet. 
all 13 brothers and sisters come up and you can change that number of siblings depending on how many are in your group they come up and together they say be quiet and finally at the end mom has to call the police officers who come up and tell him to be quiet, right? So all those characters come and go and tell this little boy to be quiet, but he keeps singing in between every visit until finally everybody's arguing at the, at the bottom of the steps and he comes out in my version and says, hey everybody, be quiet. A kid can't get any sleep around here. But that came out of a time when I was playing with a group of kids and they came up with a new ending. In Robert Munch's book, he just falls asleep. So when I was playing this story with all my props and let the kids take over, they came up with a whole new ending. So Mortimer's a really wonderful one to play with, right? So um, that's a great one to start with, actually. If you're a little nervous about doing this with kids, this is a really simple, wonderful one to start with. Um, the other one that I have on my list, and again, all these animal props that I've already made get used again. You may have seen this story, Too Much Noise. So he's a man in a house, you know, and he thinks the tea kettle's too loud and the floor squeaks too much and the bed screens are blanket too much. And he goes to a wise person who's a wizard. He goes to the wizard and he says, what should I do? And the wizard tells him to put the horse in his house. He thinks it's not really a great idea, but he does it. And then the horse is in there. Nee! So same props, right? Same kind of pattern. He tells him to put the cow in there and the pig in there and the dog and the cat. They're all making their animal noises. And the man realizes it's way more noisy now. And he goes back to the wise man and says, now what should I do? It's really noisy. And he says, go take the cow out the horse out, you can do it one at a time, or you can say, go let those animals back outside, and he lets them all out, and when he goes back into his house after that, the tea kettle sounds kind of gentle, and the squeaky floor is kind of comforting, and the springs in his bed make him feel like taking a nap, and that's how it ends. He lays down and takes a nap because it's finally quiet in the house again. So you can see how you can use all those props again, and it's one of those add-on stories and it doesn't matter how many kids are in your story time. You can add as many parts or as few parts as you want. So check out Too Much Noise. It's a great one. Okay. So where are we, Kat? We're almost there. Okay. We, have, we do have a question. Okay. Um, so somebody was wondering, what do you do to perhaps um, keep the props out of the way when, um, when kids Before are playing? ready so they don't come up and grab yeah. them? Mm -hmm. so have you guys ever done the tape line? Nobody steps over the tape line. I usually have a table behind me and sometimes I have them in a bin so they can't see them right away. And I pull them out one at a time so they're not tempted to go up and grab everything. So either a bin or a table behind you and a tape on the floor that said nobody comes over the tape because I have some items that are a secret that I want to share with you and, and I want to do it at a certain time. So those are some solutions to that. And I have a, a second suggestion as well. The caterpillar one. I keep in a basket or a box um, and they don't usually, you know, when it's time to put on the caterpillar, I put it on my lap and then I pull yeah. the pieces out of the basket. One at so, a time. Mm -hmm. So they're not all out there being tempting, right? Right. So right. you're going to do whatever you can to not make it so tempting so that they don't come up and grab on because we've all been there too, right? And they're grabbing and taking everything and not all the parents think that that's, you know, not okay. <laughs> So you've got to do things to manage things like that. So tape right. line, box, bag, um, basket, table behind you, and you're in front of it, and you're reaching to go get those things. They can't get behind you, right? So yep. those are some solutions for that. Or even a tablecloth over the items on the table. Yep, a and, tablecloth over it when they first come in so they can't see anything. Yeah. Right, right. Other so, questions? Any other questions here? I do have a video Jen wanted me to share. Do you want to tell them about this video? I'm, oh, we don't have time to share it, but. Um, I had a few other, how, how bad is it? <laughs> Two minutes? So yep. I'm just going to talk about the end of this and what else is in your handout and some of the things that I brought because um, to me, it's really important that they're playing with story and they're playing with sequence, but I also feel like they really need to play with their bodies and their minds. And so I often do really simple group building games with them during my story time. So I have given you um, in your handout many sources for where to go for those games. 
And I gave you actually copied out of the pages of one of those um, sources, the New Games book, which you may have heard of, a few that really work well. So let me show you just a couple. Um, and you might be familiar with these already. One that's really easy for students to do together is to stand in a circle and hold hands, right? So everybody's standing in a circle and they're holding hands. I insert a hula hoop between two of the students, two of the kids. They're holding hands. And you may have done this before. It's really great coordination, large motor skills. The goal is to get the hoop all the way around the circle without anybody letting go of hands. So they have to help each other by doing this, or doing this, and it goes down, and they come up, and it'll be on the other person's arm. And then without letting go of hands, they have to either lean into it and help the other person get it over their head and all the way down around their body until it goes on to the next person. So it's called circle to circle. And I have found that for the little ones, especially if we help them, they're so close to the ground, they just step through and they're really good at helping each other. And I'm not really rigid about not letting go of hands. You know what I mean? So the goal is to get the hoop all the way around. So that's a really great one for them. Um, another one that I do with them is called um, lap ball. So everybody sits on the floor with their feet in the center and their legs straight. Their hands have to be behind them. They cannot use their hands in this one. I call it the great big lily pad. And then the balls that I use, I say they're turtles. Some of my balls are green, this one's yellow. That they have to get the turtle all the way around the lily pad without the turtle falling in the water. So on the first leg of this, no pun intended, they're all sitting in a circle. Their toes are to the center. They're sitting very close together so there's not space and their hands are behind them. They can't use their hands, but they have to bop this ball all the way around on each other's laps until it gets back to the person where it began. All right. So then if you have an older group of kids, this is way challenging enough for those pods and kindergarten and first graders. They don't need more than that. You might add a few more balls to the group, right, and let them roll a bunch of them around. And then it's sort of like um, a popcorn popper, you know, the balls are kind of bopping around and they love that. If you have an older group, you can then take the big ball away and do a smaller ball and see if they can't get that around on their laps. And then you can take that one away and have an even smaller ball. And this is for older kids. This is really hard for the little ones to do. So this is probably six and above with this one, all the way around again. And it's great motor skill, gross and, and small motor skills, plus they giggle and have a great time doing this. So these are some of the games that you can add to your story time to get them to play in a whole different way, right? Um, let me see how we're doing. We're over time now. I'm just gonna explain um, some of the other ones. So I'll just do one more with you. Um, there's one called spirals. And so they all hold hands. Somebody who's more courageous is the middle kid. And you start leading the, the end of the line around and around in a spiral. And what happens is they're all holding hands. One kid's in the middle. And as those kids spiral and spiral, it gets tighter and tighter around that middle child. And they have a spiral around them. It ends up being a, a group hug. So again, everybody's holding hands, one kid's in the middle, you're leading the end of the line and you start making circles around that middle child. And the spiral gets smaller and smaller and smaller until everybody's in a hug, right? Now you can end it there, or you can ask that courageous middle kid who got hugged to find his way out, but you can't let go of hands. So he starts leading his way out through the crowd, sort of underneath, and he's got the next person behind him and the next person behind him, and you undo the spiral by having that middle child lead everybody out. So it's a wonderful way to get a group hug and also a little cognitive development, gross motor skills, plus they have a ton of fun doing that one. So look at the um, sources that I gave you. You can look up, there's a, a link um, that was really great. It's called What Will We Play Today? The woman's name is Jean R. Feldman, who wrote the book. And all of these group games are geared toward the little ones, not the older kids. So that's the first link in your handout on the page that says group play for story time. And then I gave you a couple of other guides that you can go to to grab ideas and a few in your packet that are already there to give you the directions to start right away. All right. So... Are there any questions out there that you would like to ask?
And while we're waiting for questions, I'm just going to share our, our start screen again so that you can see uh, the link to the handout for today as well as our survey. So please, please, please uh, uh, fill out that survey. It's very quick. Um, we have to ask a few questions um, to support our funding from the Institute of Museum and Library Services so that we can have Jennifer back again. <laughs> I should tell you all that I'm available to come and do trainings and performances at all of your libraries. If you want me to come and do this for your families or you want me to come and do this for your story time, also on May 30th, um, the Mid-Michigan Library League is having me do a four-hour workshop for librarians, youth librarians, mm -hmm. and it's going to be in Cadillac at the Wexford branch. So at the Wexford Library in Cadillac, on May 30th, it starts at 10 in the morning and it goes to 2.30, and everybody's welcome, whether you're in that co-op or not, and I'm going to be doing a lot of what we did today and in some of the other webinars, helping youth librarians um, with best story time practices. So check that out. It's the Mid-Michigan Library League, and the, it's on May 30th. I'll have it on my calendar. If I ever get to updating my calendar this weekend, maybe, I'll have it on my calendar on my website, but you can also check with the Mid-Michigan Library League for that information. Great workshop. Um, the woman in charge of that co-op is Cheryl Mace. So you're going to want to uh, get a hold of her if you're anywhere nearby. If you want to travel to that workshop, I'd be happy to be there with you live. It would be a real treat. <laughs> yeah, and thank you, Jen, for putting up with all of this. It, <laughs> it is very hard to act it out and play in front of nobody. Nobody. <laughs> Yeah, a very no, quiet. I wanted to bring like a group of little people into this tiny little conference room today so they could show you how this looks. But I'm counting on the fact that librarians have incredible imaginations and creativity and that you'll be able to take some of the ideas that I shared with you today and expand them and use them in your story times. So yeah. I hope it was helpful. Well, thank you, Jen, and thank, thank you, you everyone for watching today. Please take a minute, fill out that survey. Let us know if you have any topic ideas you'd like to see. Um, brought to you in the coming year or so, uh, especially around storytelling and story time. So please send us that feedback. And thank you everybody for joining us today. Thank you, I hope you use the ideas and give me a, a shout out if you need some help, okay? Yeah, please please, please, please feel free to contact us. Yep. See you everybody. Yep.